All right. Are we ready? You can go. Hello, and welcome to the National Road Safety Partnership Program webinar, Using Data for Prevention, Driver Safety, Reducing Road Instances, and Lowering Costs. Uh, my name is Jerome Karzak, I'm Director of the NHP and its many activities. Uh, to find out more, please visit the NHP website and register for our newsletter or follow us on our social media page, such as LinkedIn. Uh, next sli slide, please, Andreas. Oh, so that's me, if you can't uh, recognise who I am. Um, next slide, please. Today's session will go for approximately 60 minutes. And we've allocated 40 minutes for Andre um, and 20 minutes for questions. And we're going to be recording this session as well and it will be shared on the NHP website. And an email will be sent out to everyone tomorrow with a PowerPoint and a link to it. Um, next slide, please. We do love to have your input and to make the webinar as interactive as possible. So please send your questions through by typing them into the question box. Um, I've also opened up the chat. Um, and feel free to comment or place elements in there. But our main aim is if you could please put them in the question box, any questions you have. Now, over to our presenter. You can see smiling away there. Morning, uh, uh, Andreas. Good morning. How are you all? I'm very good, mate. And I'm going to sing out your praise on this one as it is 8 p.m. in Monday over in the U.S. And it's a public holiday as well. So you've really gone above and beyond. <laughs> Happy so to be here, really. <laughs> So let me just tell you a little bit about this amazing person who's going to be presenting to us. Um, so Andreas has been for seven years a senior scientist at the US Center for Disease Control and Prevention, or known as the CDC, where he leads and advises on global violence prevention research and policy. Uh, his mission is to design, implement, and apply state-of-the-art methodologies to address the complex challenges of preventing and reducing violence, especially against children and marginalized population. He has over 30 years of experience in public health, injury prevention, and global health, including transport safety, which is why we've got you online now. Over to you, mate. Thank you very much, and a real pleasure being with you here. I also have an affiliation with the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, which is why you see that title there. Um, and uh, I will transition now to uh, the topic that we are going to discuss today. Um, transportation injuries are really a quite a complex uh, problem that we are confronted with. It's a problem that since the 19th century started with one case and now more than 120,000 deaths uh, occur with millions of injuries and incidents occurring all over the world. We can define it as the study of the patterns and causes of transport injuries in human populations. That is transportation injuries or transportation safety addresses that. And there are several strategies to address that particular problem. I come from a public health perspective, so I have my own biases and formulation for public health. But one of the things that I want to reiterate is that typically these problems of injuries are not an issue that belongs to public health or to the law or to a particular uh, agency or sector. These problems typically need to be addressed from a multi-sectoral, multi-agency perspective because they are so complex and so important. Um, we can do many things in studying transportation safety or transportation injuries. We can describe the nature of injuries in populations in terms of where they occur, to whom they occur, uh, at what time they occur, during what times of the year, or in a specific calendar time do they occur. We can link those to different factors that may make them more likely to occur or less likely to occur. And then if those factors or a association exists, we can determine whether it's a causal association or just a serendipitous type of association and then modify those causes to reduce the injuries. Typically, we understand this problem as a problem that uh, affects a person or multiple people where those people are interacting with vehicles. And those vehicles don't need to be necessarily motorized vehicles. You as a pedestrian are actually exercising a type of transportation mode. You can be in no motorized vehicles like a bicycle, et cetera. But just to understand it is just uh, basically the interactions with a person in a mode of transport and that person is moving themselves or they're moving themselves within an environment, a physical 
in a social environment where there are interpersonal relationships or institutional and community types of rules and norms, and all that within a societal and cultural perspective. So in different cultures, in different societies, in different places, you may have problems that emerge more frequently than others because that society or that particular place is organized in a different way. And that manifests itself in the different type of phenomena that you can observe in transportation safety. And we have typically, and I group them in three types of, of uh, strategies, engineering strategies, which include not only engineering of vehicles, but also engineering of the physical and even the social environment, changing and modifying those environments. Enforcement activities, really important to enforce a variety of norms and regulations that we have around transportation. And education or behavioral modifications, which are really important when you are addressing the behavior, the conduct, and the way people uh, use vehicles or conduct themselves within a transportation system. So within this type of model, we understand all of the problems that we're going to look at. But it's really important to figure out what is it that we wanna, what we want to ask, because what type of question we want to ask and we want to answer, depending on that question, we're going to want to look at some type of data that is going to inform us about that. I can be interested in studying people who are injured, or I can be interested in studying a vehicle design and the features of that vehicle during a crash, for example. Or I may be interested in uh, studying the performance of a road or street infrastructure under certain conditions. How are they used by people? What are the advantages of designing one thing versus another? I can be interested in looking at interventions that modify a particular problem that I could that, that I described. And I can even be interested in looking at the cost that that entails, human costs, material costs, and what doing something costs versus what not doing anything costs also. So defining the issue and defining the question really moderates and modulates what type of data I'm, I'm going to be needing. I can also, when I look at an injury, an injury event is uh, has a, a series of characteristics. You, you have a crash. In the crash, you can have one person involved in the crash, or you can have multiple people involved in the crash. You can have one vehicle or multiple vehicles, or you can have a person against the vehicle. You can have multiple injured people, which could be drivers, occupants, pedestrians, for example, or you could be looking at multiple injuries between people, which can be fatal or non-fatal, or you can look at multiple injuries affecting a single person. Or you can look at multiple injuries affecting an organ of a person. So there's so many ways of looking at this problem that it's really important to understand what is it that we want to look at. Because for each one of these type of questions and issues, we are going to need data. And those data exist and those data can be integrated and those data can actually inform us in a variety of ways and can depict the type of context in which these events are occurring. As we understand better the context, we can therefore modify it in a much more eloquent way. So what, what to measure? I can measure individual, legal, or environmental or economic conditions. Um, for example, the characteristics of a pedestrian or a driver driving a lorry. The speed and uh, the effect of speed in alcohol legislation as a legal measure and what effect that has on incidents that may be occurring on the road. The effect of different designs of the physical environment, for example, an intersection, a crosswalk, a highway, a rural road. Specific safety intervention to changing some of those designs or making legal changes or changing behaviors. Does that alter the likelihood that I am affected by an injury? And I can look at the costs of that. How much does it cost to do something versus how much does it cost to actually have to deal with the consequences of a crash, of injuries, and the cost that that entails for individuals, for companies, and for populations as a whole. So I can look at risk uh, assessments and can, and can look at different exposures also. And I can also look at it in different contexts. What is my population? I can define if I want to look at incidents in a particular 
a company that works on transportation safety. My denominator may be all the employees in the, of the company that, that may lead or may be in touch with the transportation mode at some point as part of their job. That's my population. But I could be interested also, since they interact with the rest of the population, in what are the effects of an event or an incident occurring on the larger population as a whole. And I can measure that in terms of population. I can measure it as a number of registered vehicles, or I can measure it as a exposure, how many kilometers per vehicle I have driven. That's the exposure that I have. So there's different ways of measuring things. And all of these different ways and how I pose my questions is going to modulate many times what type of data I need and what data I collect and what data are useful. The easiest way to measure injuries is fatalities. Um, they are the least number of injuries, fortunately, um, and they're the easiest to measure for obvious reason. Um, but beneath that, we typically have problems that may be injuries resulting in hospitalizations or going to emergency departments or injuries that just require some primary care or injuries that don't require any treatment. Nonetheless, injuries that happened. We can even have crash events that don't have injuries at all, but they are still a crash event. And it's important to understand that also in the context of risk. And for that, data are really important. Where do we get the sources of data? We can get it from the police. We can get data from the justice system. Um, any incident event that is recorded will go typically to databases within the police and the justice sector. Health systems collect a ton of information, hospital systems, medical examiners or coroners, uh, wherever they exist, will collect information on fatalities and on certain conditions. We can get information about cities and the structures of cities, so census offices and cadastres or cadastral information about the structure of a city can actually provide us very important contextual information about where is that events are happening. And I'll show you some examples of that. We can collect information by asking the population or by asking communities from the private sector, transportation enterprises, from insurance companies that collect information and describe uh, and require a description of how events happen. Um, and even from newspapers, we, when, when sources are not that reliable, you can actually collect information. So all of the sources collect a variety of types of data that when integrated, give us a really comprehensive picture of how things are happening and perhaps informs us much better and in a more efficient way what we can do about a problem. Now we can collect data partially and that data are going, those data are going to be useful, like just how big a problem is or if it's getting bigger or worse or if it's the same or who is affected, if it's drivers or users or everyone. Um, where are events happening? When are events happening? How is it that events happening? How did a crash occur? What led to one thing to the other uh, to a final consequence of a crash? And who is most likely to be involved? So these are different types of questions that we can learn. And sometimes we ask just a few of them and those give us some interesting answers. The more we ask and the more we integrate information, the more we share information, the better the context we are going to have about how events in transportation safety are occurring. And consequently, the better information we're going to have uh, to solve those particular problems. We understand the transportation system as a system in general, sorry for the redundancy, but that system and that system approach means, uh, has a series of means. There, there are people involved, there are vehicles involved, there are speeds, at which you drive, their road or infrastructure conditions where you drive. And if a crash event, there needs to be a system of post-crash care, a response system that is effective. We know that within this system, humans are always vulnerable and they are more vulnerable depending on the, on the mode of transportation that they're using. The most vulnerable ones, people walking, pedestrians, uh, or people riding a bicycle or people riding a motorcycle. Compared if I crash a bicycle against a lorry, well, the transfer of energy from the lorry to the bicycle is going to be huge and it's going to 
put in great peril that vulnerable person. We know also that humans always make mistakes. Their behavior, our behavior is always subject to mistakes. Um, we can be paying attention at some points and at other points we're not paying attention and maybe an event happens. So we're going to try to minimize the likelihood that those mistakes will lead into an incident that might lead into a crash and a death or a serious crash, uh, which is really what within this safe system approach we want to a death or a serious injury become an unacceptable type of event. So we are going to try to do as many things as possible to prevent those serious events from happening. As I've told you, from all those multiple sources of information, one of the key messages is that the responsibility that we have for safety is a shared responsibility. Multiple sectors are involved, and each one has a, ty a type of mission to accomplish a type of responsibility that concerns them, but then when working in tandem or working uh, with others is actually a synergistic approach that leads to more safety. The other thing is that safety is proactive. We need to be thinking about safety. We need to be thinking about prevention. We need to be thinking and understanding how events happen so we can prevent them from happening. And creating redundancy within a system of safety is really important. If you look at airplane safety, you see that many times airplanes have three computers so that if one fails, there's still two as a backup. Those redundancies are really essential and they work the same. We can create a lot of redundancies within uh, a safe system approach in transportation. That in essence builds resilience of the system so that if something fails in a particular system of transportation, we have other things backing it up that still are providing safety. So if a behavior of a person fails, we can still have design in elements uh, that are preventing or minimizing the risks and the bad outcomes that a particular event might lead to. And any activity aims towards safety needs to be informed by evidence. That's super important, it's really crucial because when we collect data, when we collect information and we know the context in which events are happening, we can actually respond on the basis of that information. And typically that is going to save us a lot of money. If we put out money on something that we infer may be happening without much knowledge of what is really happening, maybe we're throwing a lot of resources that we could more responsibly use. So evidence and, and, and gaining that context through data is really, really important. So we can collect information from a variety of systems. As I mentioned, the characteristics of vehicles. What is the vehicle size? Does it carry cargo? Does it carry passengers? What is the condition of the vehicle? What are the safety features that the vehicle has? Is it a safety feature that comes from the factory? Do I need to purchase safety features in addition or options for that vehicle to make it more safe? Um, what are the behaviors of drivers? Do they use seat belts? Do they drive under the influence of a variety of sub substances? Do they comply with the speed limits or with the distance between vehicles? Um, what are the conditions of the roadways and the characteristics of a particular setting? Well, in a place you could have a massive storm during the night, and that's very different than traveling on a dry uh, place uh, with full sunlight. Uh, at the same time, I can be in that place with full sunlight, but full of traffic versus with very little traffic. And so those conditions are going to be very different. How people use the roadways the speed that they use, the density of traffic, the weather, all these issues are really important. And the types of users, I can have cars combined with lorries, combined with bus, and a variety of settings are going to have all those combinations and some other settings are not gonna have all those combinations. So place is really important. And then around that, we have a, ser a series of norms and laws. So from the legislative perspective, perspective well, what are the speed laws? What are the alcohol uh, laws or other substance uh, restrictions laws for driving? Do they apply to every driver in the same way or are they more strict for certain drivers than others? Occupational issues are really important. If I work on moving cargo from one place of the country to another, are the hours of work 
that I invest in doing my job in moving that cargo hours that are going to help me be in a proper physical and psychological condition so that my behavior will be at optimal stage. At the same time, is the vehicle in which I'm moving in the proper conditions um, for me to transport that cargo over one place to another. So there's a variety of intersecting and interacting levels of vehicle, of person, and of environment that are always going to be acting. And data can be collected from all of them. And data can be integrated to understand the context of an event in a much better way. Here we have, and I'm, I'm, I'm uh, using some of the reports that have been produced in, in Australia, we uh, see that uh, incidents um, have been increasing uh, by 27%, um, and uh, they have increased over a, a period of years. So there's a trend that is going in the wrong direction. There's uh, information that losses have uh, risen across almost any code of transport and that many are related to human factors. So these behavioral issues that inattention or distraction incidents are very common. Um, and that uh, inappropriate speed may be one of, of the conditions that may be leading to a lot of the situations. There's a very high proportion of events that involve a single vehicle as opposed to multiple vehicles. And then there's an issue with distances and, and following distance. So there's a ton of data here that describes a trend over time, that describes behavioral elements, that describes uh, places where things are occurring, that describe conditions, speed, distance that are involved. But there are some that maybe we could also collect that could give us more information. We also know from the same report that about a third of those events that are related to inattention or distraction are occurring in urban settings as opposed to rural settings. And that's important. That's already an important element of data that we know because then we are going to be focalized in what is going on in those urban settings. And there are four versions, four examples that we're given here of people uh, uh, getting out of a path in a straight line or interacting uh, because of short distance, getting into an incident with another vehicle or because of speed, getting off a path on a curve or just having other type of events. And those are all modulated by a variety of factors. It could be fatigue, an individual uh, could be fatigued or distracted or have a family issue. Maybe there's some really bad thing happening in the family of that person. That person is preoccupied with something else and that is affecting their performance. So that redundancy that I was talking about in vehicles, in the roads is going to be important in those cases when sometimes the behavior cannot be controlled. And the behavior is one of the most difficult things to control, which is why in transportation safety, we do a lot of interventions that try to uh, address safety by extricating or by eliminating the behavioral component of individuals. So we do it by design sometimes, but we can't, we can't extricate it completely. However, we can use that as an element of safety. And of course, all of that, as I mentioned, has cost implications, human and monetary costs. So there are multiple ways, as I mentioned at the beginning, of addressing these safety issues through environmental modifications, either the social or the physical environment, or engineering vehicles, making them safer by default, addressing rules and existing laws. That is the enforcement perspective. The normativity is important and then addressing behavior of users by education, by training, by a variety of issues. Understanding that the most fallible of all this intervention, the most difficult one to, to actually implement is the latter, is the behavioral component. Because we are fallible, we make a lot of mistakes. So a lot of the redundancies and a lot of the safety elements need to be addressed in the other two elements uh, uh, supporting this behavioral element. None is by itself useful, but um, and all are really important. And, and doing something at all of these levels, introducing those redundancies is really important. I'm going to stop here for now and let you ask questions in case there are any at this point. I've got one for you. I've got a couple for you, Andres. And I must admit, hearing the passion and how you're sort of telling and, and talking, it's, it's fantastic. So thank you. Um, on the system slide, you mentioned how 
safety is proactive and prevention is key. One of the hardest things is how do you get people to buy into prevention and making the investment? Because a lot of things we find, a lot of organisations in particular, wait until something's go wrong before they go, oh, now we do it. That's a really good question. Well, there, there's there's many, many ways of doing it. Um, one, there are examples from many places in the world where different type of approaches have been implemented that maybe haven't implemented in one setting. Maybe you're describing a particular condition in Australia that has not been implemented in Australia, but has been implemented elsewhere. And so learning from those interventions from other places is important. So knowing that something works is important. To know that something works, we obviously need to collect data. Now, something might work in the United Kingdom, but it might not work in Australia. So it is really important to replicate things and to replicate these problems. Um, the other argument that is really important is that we know that not doing anything, and this has been shown in many places of the world, not doing anything for safety is actually way more costly than actually implementing interventions that promote safety. Uh, and those costs, I'm talking not only about economic costs, which you can measure as hospital direct costs, indirect costs for the family, indirect costs for corporations or companies, indirect costs for society as a whole and losses over time, shortening of the lifespan of people and uh, degradation of that whole healthy component of a society at the expense of not doing anything for safety. So safety is costly. Lack of safety is costly, sorry. Lack of safety is very costly. Doing something for prevention is important. And so learning from evidence, collecting data to understand our context and coming up with solutions that may be local, but that draw from lessons from other places is really important. Now, there, there's many, many techniques that can address this particular type of problem. And there are experts and there are people in academia, for example, that can be your partner to help you answer some of those questions, implement some of those methods that is that, that are really important. But I think one powerful argument is that not doing anything is considerably more costly from a human perspective and a material perspective than actually engaging in prevention. Nice. Um, question here from Mick. How do you think the increasing reliance on automated vehicle functions be reflected in these type of data analysis? Well, that's a really important question. It's really interesting. I think a lot of the automation provides important data. One, you can actually, with automated information, you can collect data on an ongoing way, considerable amount of information about the details and conditions of, say, a motor vehicle. The same way technology has become incredibly automated in an airplane um, and all the information is collected to understand all the circumstances that might lead to an unlikely event of an incident in an airplane, that level of technology can also be implemented within vehicles. But that's just one element, vehicles. Technology can be used to observe the behavior of drivers. It has been used. It's used in many places to actually, as a, as a behavioral level of enforcement or to understand or to study under certain conditions how people respond and address consequently preventative type of strategies uh, on the occurrence of uh, specific type of situations. You can collect information about the environment also. And so automation is important in, and has been applied in some places more than other, others. Um, entire or complete automation, as you know, you know, driverless vehicles are not a effective technology yet. They're used in some settings, they are still quite imperfect. And so uh, perhaps some of those technologies are nascent, they're interesting, they may actually you may incorporate to some of those technologies eventually legislative measures so that you know a particular vehicle will not go above a certain speed or will maintain a certain distance. And it, all of that is based on technology. And you're taking out there 
the behavior of the person and putting it in the technology. We are not quite there yet. There are many settings in this planet where a lot of the motor pool that exists, a lot of the vehicles that exist, one, are older, are uh, come from a variety of different places and cannot interact in such a connected way. It is promising. It is a very interesting technique, not only to enforce and ensure that a series of safe driving conditions are obtained, but also if there is a problem, there are also good methods of collecting data and they're important. I think we're still not quite there, but it's a promising area indeed. Great, and I've got one little quick question then we'll move on. Um, with 23, and you may not be able to answer this one being US-based, with 23% increase in road incidences, is there a particular group or sector of society that contributed to this increase? Well, I, from what I know in Australia, the majority of, of motor vehicle injuries are actually related to motor vehicles, to not, not pedestrians, not cyclists, not motorcycles, but actual four-wheelers or, or, or you know, cars. Um, so the density uh, of, of motor vehicles, the increasing speeds, um, the type of roadways that we have may be modulating a lot of those increases. Um, and what we are trying to avoid in many, in many cases in principle is to avoid the conflict between those, one, different modes of transportation, but a particular conflict that may lead into a crash. So I, perhaps, Jerome, you know much better than I do the the whole epidemiology of this problem in Australia, but certainly Australia is a very highly motorized country, and it is motor vehicles the ones that are driving most of these issues. I don't know if you want to say something else about that. Ah, oh, I think we need this is where we need one of the thing is more data, more holistic data, bringing it all together to understand the problem and um, to explore it. So I think uh, my colleagues would like to hear that, but I think that's the thing, and then testing some hypotheses against it and seeing how we can sort of turn it, turn it around as well. But anyway, should we dive on in? Yes, yes, absolutely. So collecting that information and collecting information to understand what is it that is driving that increase in Australia is really important. It is really key to understand the context in which things are happening. There's a, on, on, on the urban setting, you can see a couple of images from Melbourne and you can see a couple of images that are very different. One that has segregated modes of transportation there. There's a tram separated from a bike route, separated from the cars, separated from the pedestrians, and you see a large congested avenue there where speeds and density are going to be at a certain level. That's one setting, That's or two settings in an urban setting that has multiple types of settings. You have also rural settings where you may have a very well uh, paved road with a good tarmac and and, and good conditions uh, where you can go really fast and where there's very few traffic. You can also have very complex intersections. These are from the United States, but I'm sure intersections that are complex like that in large urban areas uh, are, are uh, also existing in Australia. And so you can, when you start increasing this complexity in some certain places, increasing speeds, increasing the complexity of roadways, then it is really important because what you are going to do in the urban setting that you're seeing on the left-hand side is going to be very different from what you can do in the setting, the rural setting, where you're seeing uh, that you can see on the other side, on the right-hand side. You have more people, more vehicles, more interactions on the urban setting than on the rural setting, where the problems may be different. You can deviate from the road because it's straight for hours and hours and you may fall asleep and you deviate from the road and you crash. That's a very different reason than interacting or entering into conflicts with other vehicles in an urban setting. And so context is really, really essential always. In terms of safety interventions, I had mentioned that you can do interventions that eliminate human behavior. They're called passive interventions and interventions that are more active because they depend on modifying human behavior. Data can be collected for that. So I will show you how we can look at the design of roads and streets or the design of vehicles by collecting data. And you can also collect data on speed and on seatbelt use. So some of those uses of technologies that have cameras, for example, observing drivers are actually meant to look at the behavior of individuals 
and and can actually connect and measure the speed of a vehicle, the behaviors of the individual. Even they can actually look at, you can actually look at where the eyes of the driver are looking at to determine whether there are events of distraction. So technology has arrived and we use technology many times to understand behaviors like that, or in certain places to ensure in certain companies or in certain places to ensure that the drivers that we have hired to work on a particular type of job are doing their job in an appropriate manner. Let's look at passive interventions and look at the, the how speed can be controlled. So speed is not only telling people, hey, drive slower because it's dangerous. You can actually, by design, make people reduce their speed. And they're, when you introduce what is called traffic calming information, there are a variety of, of designs, chokers, diagonal narrowing, islands that you can create, chicanes or zigzags. These are all designed to lower the speed of vehicle. And you can actually measure them. You can actually capture information on all of these measures and measure the likelihood and the types of events that occur, the type of incidents that occur. For example, the school setting, when you create an island, what you are doing by creating an island is reducing the distance for a pedestrian to travel from one side of the street to the other. So they have that safety place in the middle where they can stop and they'll have less time to interact with a motor vehicle. At the same time, the islands are going to be an object that makes it more difficult for the vehicle to be driving at a faster speed. And so by design, you're reducing um, the speed through structure, through actually creating different structures. Another passive measure, measure is through function of the system. So you can do traffic calming by creating synchronized traffic lights. Sometimes, if you have driven in certain urban settings at certain points of the day, you have a green light and invariably the next street, you're gonna find it red and it makes you stop again. And then it goes green and the next one is gonna be red again and it makes you stop again. That is intentional. It's, it's, it's done to actually alter and maintain a slower flow of the traffic, a much more organized flow of the traffic and through that elicit less speeds by design. So the behavior of people is much less involved in this condition. You also have normative measures. There's speed limit, limit legislation in Australia, and there are massive ways of doing it. You have speed cameras that are just taking pictures there, and uh, you have red, red light cameras or you have speed cameras. They're going to be photographing um, whether you're not uh, over uh, doing it in terms of speed or not. And then you have obviously active measures. The police can actually measure, follow you and stop you and give you a fine for speeding. And laws vary depending on the type of vehicles. There are laws that are typically more restrictive for motor vehicles that are heavy vehicles versus lighter vehicles, both speeding laws as well as substance use laws. Uh, typically driving a heavy vehicle means you cannot drink at all. Driving a lighter vehicle, maybe you're allowed to drink to a very narrow percentage. And then those laws are also behind the whole framework. So these are these are other ways of addressing speed, not only behavior, not only telling and training the person to drive at a slower speed. So these are some of those resilient and redundant mechanisms that we have. And of course, we have behavioral measures. We have licensing regulations. It's very different to get a license for a lorry than to get a, dri a driver's license for a motorcycle or a motor vehicle. Um, and you have driver training that you need to get your license. There's also occupational norms. Uh, under certain circumstances, you should not drive. If you, if part of your occupation is driving, there are certain norms that may protect you um, in terms of the way you, you need to drive, the hours you need to drive. And then there are other harder to measure uh, elements that may be related to socioeconomic, family, social context of drivers. They may influence that. I Maybe a driver had a loss in their family. Someone died and they're very sad and distracted and thinking about their loss and in bereavement, and that is going to affect their performance while driving. Um, it is not something intentional, but it is a factor that is external that is going to modify the behavior of that individual. And so it is really important to account for all of this information. 
not all of the information of the context of people is easy to collect, but a lot of the context of the contextual information can be collected. Um, back to the 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 road that I mentioned, uh, or the the strategies that I mentioned. Another way of avoiding conflict, of avoiding crashes, is by separating the users. So here's a perfect example by design from two cities, where you can see that the different circles, uh, motor vehicles on one side, the tram in the center bicycles and pedestrians are separated. So what you're doing is you're minimizing the likelihood they will enter into conflict. And by observing this and by collecting data on how events occur in these places, you can actually measure the effect of the separation of users and whether uh, a car or a bike is hitting a pedestrian or hitting a biker. The same we have here, a motor vehicle, a tram, a bike lane, and then the pedestrian uh, sidewalk um, there in Spain. Um, many places have instituted that. And so that principle of separating the modes of transportation by design is reducing the risks that they will enter into conflict. Enter into conflict means crash in this particular context. You can also have legal approaches on city planning. I can design a commercial center as the uh, a, a little commercial center on this side and perhaps there's a housing area that could be designed on the other side of the street. But if I design it on this same side of the street, then I'm going to avoid those people who live in that housing complex from crossing my large road uh, when they go and need to go to the commercial area. So the planning of different places is important. It's not possible in every place, but it is important to consider it. Of course, you could build a bridge, a pedestrian bridge, etc. So there are many legislative approaches that can say, well, hey, you should build here and not on the other side because it's just more appropriate from a safety perspective. The use of the land is also important. If you use land only for residential purposes versus for industrial only purposes, or if you want to use have mixed land use, that's another way of collecting information because uh, in mixed land use, you're combining living quarters with commercial quarters where everyone is interacting at that same time. How does that affect injuries? You can actually measure that. And that's why I was telling you at the beginning that collecting information about cities, about the built infrastructure of places is also very informative because it's going to tell you how that structure is relating to where events happen. And I'm gonna show you some very specific examples. This is a map of a urban setting in Australia that I took from the Transport Modelers Alliance from New South Wales. And as you can see here, there's a variety of intersections or places where you can see that the different colors actually depict one, the, the red ones, a higher number of events. So what we call hotspots, though the red areas are where more events or crashes tend to occur. But then you can actually depict the types of events and where they are occurring. This is a side swipe event, the triangles, or you have a collision with a big, with a big object, or you have a left, left turn type of incident or a right turn type of incident. And so you can actually collect a ton of information of the type of event that is occurring in a place and then try to understand the place. So looking at those hot, hot spots in urban settings, classifying the type of incident and documenting when and where is it occurring is extremely important. And you need, this is, this is data. This is data that you're collecting from a specific space and you can collect it not only in space, you can also collect it in space and time. So here is a depiction of another city. And as you can see in the slide, the hotspots are actually moving. These are monthly changes of pedestrian injuries, pedestrian fatalities in an urban setting. What you can see over time is that the hotspots change every month, but there are some of the darker spots that remain. How the data collected on that helps you? Well, it is helping you already understand that <clears throat> over time, there are, there are some places that are going to be of much higher risk. So maybe that 27% that we were talking about that of increase in, in Australia and that third of incidents that are occurring in urban settings, I can bet that they are not occurring 
in entire urban settings, but in some very specific areas. And those specific areas tend to be rather small areas that you can study, that you can modify, and where an investment would take you a really long way in terms of addressing safety. So it's really, really important to understand that and integrate those data into your incidents. Not only the behavior of the driver, but where is it that is occurring? And of course, the conditions of the vehicles that they're driving. So to understand that physical environment, you can do what is called street audits. And there's a ton of methods for that. You can look at physical attributes of a place and look at all the services that that place has. So you can measure where the hospitals are, where the police stations are, where there are bars. We know, for example, that places with a higher concentration of pubs or bars tend to have a higher Around those areas, there tends to be higher incidence of injuries. Where, where are there bus stations, businesses, industries? Whether the road system or the streets in a particular setting has appropriate light, or are there safety cameras for enforcement? What are the access points to those places? How is the overall road system built? Is the land use residential, commercial, industrial only? If a hotspot in a particular place is occurring in an industrial only area, but we want to know why. What is it that's happening there? Is it because of the design of the road system? Is it because there's no light? The events are occurring at a certain time, or are they occurring at any time? And so all of that implies collection of data that is going to give you invaluable information about context. You can look at socioeconomic level. In some places, you find that people who are affected by a certain type of road traffic injury are of a certain socioeconomic level because they tend to use a mode of transportation of a certain type. You can do surveys in the population to understand how people access their employment. When I leave my house, if I am a lorry driver and I have to go to my place of employment, maybe I have to walk, so I'm a pedestrian. And if I take public transportation, then I'm a passenger in public transportation. I get out of the bus and then uh, or the tram and I walk to my place of employment, I become a pedestrian again, and then I drive a lorry, I become a lorry driver. So in a whole sequence of a whole day, I am using different modes of transportation and safety needs to address. This is why it needs to be addressed as a system because I use the system and everyone uses the system at every point in time. And it is really important to understand and to understand the use of that system data are at the basis of that. You need to collect that evidence to understand. We have obviously uh, different, we mentioned uh, that, you know, a truck or a lorry can actually crash with a car or a pedestrian or another lorry. Is it a work-related event? Is it a non-work-related event? All that information is really important because it has legal implications, because it has cost implications, because it has implications for different responsibilities. But overall, this is a responsibility that is shared by everyone. When we do street audits, if we have the in red, I depicted some routes there, and you can actually link those routes to the public transportation. So the lines of colors depict a mass transportation system. On the other side, you can look at secondary routes where other uh, secondary public transportation methods exist. And so you can see how getting to a particular route can be connected to the way a public transportation and a path is linked to the overall network of transportation. So there are some places where I'll, I'm inevitably going to have to use a motor vehicle to move myself to another one place to another in a suburban area. In other areas, I may have more options to use different forms of transportation. Is it better? Is it more safe? Well, that is really important and that I can collect with data. In looking and diagnosing a particular place, I can look at that hotspot just as a graphical depiction of a particular hotspot. And I can look at, well, what is the density of people walking through that particular intersection? What is the vehicular density? What is the speed of vehicles? What is the design of the interventions there? When in the time of the day does, the, does do events occur more? Do they occur more at peak hours? Or do they occur more at night? Why is it that they're occurring? Are substance involved, et cetera? So all of the information that I can collect when I integrate it, again, 
gives me a much better context and sense of what is going on. And when I know better what is going on, I can design in a much more efficient way mechanisms for prevention or for intervening in a particular problem. I talked about redundancy, really important. So active and passive measures are important. Infrastructure and engineering and legislative and behavioral aspects are important. Multimodal use, that is the use of different modes of transportation to achieve a goal, which is either moving myself or moving cargo or moving people. In different places, you can actually have multimodal forms of transportation. Um, we know from certain cities that when you use trains and trucks to move cargo, sometimes the fact that you have two options enables you to transport cargo more efficiently and at the same time release or reduce the density of trucks that need to be in the roadway by means of the existence of trains. The same happens with cars and with people. If I have an option for a good public transportation system in an urban setting, then I have or, or good bike lanes, then maybe it's better for me or for a type of population to use a bicycle. And if I use a bicycle, that means I'm not using public transportation. And that means I'm not using a car. So the density of cars in that particular setting is going to be impacted and it's going to be less. And so I'm going to have a much more rich and multimodal form of transporting. Now, this is an ideal setting. Sometimes in many places, I in the United States where I live, uh, we are all about cars and we unfortunately have a dismal uh, transportation safety for the transportation network for trains. It used to be good about a century and a half ago or a century ago, but um, compared to the continent of Europe, for example, it's, it's very different, it's very inadequate. And so we rely a lot on road transport systems. So yes, you can invest and it costs a lot to invest on in some of these systems, but those investments are for the, on the long run, may actually bring costs, uh, reductions that are substantial and create those redundancies that are important. So generating those additional safety measures in a system that is more resilient, ends up being healthier for people and is indeed much better for the economy. Now, who can contribute with data? As I told you, any of the agencies where we collect data can contribute with that information. And any of the agencies of the sectors that actually collect this data have a role in prevention, have a shared responsibility for safety. Normative agencies who set the standards for vehicles and roads are important. The transportation sector, both public and private, is important. The type of vehicles that they have, the type of drivers that they train, the type of, of people that work for them. City planners, how are we building our cities? Our cities are a reflection, a built reflection of our societies. How are we building cities? Can we build cities that are safer by design? Enforcement agencies are really important making sure that those normative issues are actually complied with. Public health agencies that help foster preventative strategies that contribute to evaluate interventions and that contribute on the other side to respond to transportation safety emergencies in the post-crash events are really important also. The private sector or the industry that uses transportation to move its cargo or the transportation industry by itself. And the insurance companies also have an important role in not only collecting information, but ensuring that that safe environment and that safe system is preserved. Obviously, legislators are important in creating those normative rules and that legal framework. Academic centers can be really important allies in implementing innovative methods in helping you respond the questions to the problems that you have by collecting data, by analyzing those data, and by disseminating those data and providing and working with you to, to, to do that. Driving schools, and of course, everyone has a particular role in this safety environment. Now, you obviously have, with transportation safety, a variety of consequences. The most severe, as we mentioned, death, but you can also have considerable psychological impact on people. After a crash event, 
you may have drivers that are severely affected. And so it's really important to understand what are the consequences. If you have a person that is disabled for a time, there are impacts that are maybe not only to that person, but to the family of that person, to the economy of that family, and maybe to the economy of the company where, the, where that person works. So there's a whole cascade of events that if we create a safe system, we're going to be impacting. And that has economic and social uh, and human consequences. If we don't address this properly, we increase the burden to health systems because people who are injured end up in health systems and they end up diverting resources from other health problems. So they put a strain on health systems. Um, if we have the loss of a person through a crash, um, a fatal event, that person will typically, if they have a family, they will leave a lot of families, children that are unprotected. So there's a social cascade that has social and economic costs there. And of course, there are economic costs for industries in the country. So addressing safety is extremely important. And one of the bases for answering eloquently and more appropriately questions is to collect information, to analyze that information, and to make decisions based on that information. So we use the data for taking action. If we don't use it, if we collect data, but we don't use it, what is the point of collecting it? We are wasting a bunch of money and a bunch of resources. Data are really to be understood, to be used, to be shared, to be linked with other data so that we understand the context of events in a much more eloquent way. We can draw from those multiple sources and get a much better answer to our problem. And the key is, well, what if I share it and I look bad? Typically, let me tell you, one of the things that happens when we don't collect data is that problems, maybe we perceive that they're bad. When we start collecting data, many times problems get worse, but not because the problem is getting worse because we collected the data, but because we are collecting data that is actually depicting the magnitude of the problem in a much better way. And I would really want to know as a decision maker, if a problem is of a particular magnitude and is affecting a particular type of the population, I would want to know with the best possible information, who are those people, where are those events happening? Because the more precision I have in terms of the circumstances that I uh, need to study, the better and the more targeted interventions I can implement to modify that. And if it's a targeted intervention as opposed to a general one, then the costs for that targeted intervention that is better informed are going to be much less. So data are really important for taking action. And that action needs to be through a collective impact. If we don't collaborate, we're going to have cross, uh, basically people acting in different directions that may be hampering um, the overall efforts that we want to do. We want a collective impact. And for that collective impact to have, we need a collaboration. And how does that collective impact through collaboration happen? Well, there are key areas for achieving collective in impact. We need to have a, I put it here, a logic model. I can define it as a plan. We need to have an objective, a mission, a plan that overall seeks to reduce a particular increment in those incidents. <clears throat> we need to know what works not only in Australia, what works everywhere, so that we can adapt or implement or at least test something that we know works somewhere in or for the program that we are studying. We need to monitor that. So what is it before we do it? What happens when we're doing it? What happened after? Did it work or not? To do that, we need to build partnerships. This is really key. One of the key and most important aspects are partnerships private public partnerships, partnerships between academia, between government, between the private sector, between the communities that where we live are really important. In the United States, I'm gonna, let me give you an example, a partnership of mothers that were actually uh, the mothers of people who had died due to drunk driving led to Mothers Against Drunk Driving, a big movement in the United States that eventually changed the entire legislative normativity of this country in relation 
to drinking and driving because of a community organization that teamed up with evidence, with legislators, and through those partnerships, they changed that reality for a particular setting. This can be done in many places. It can take many forms. And those partnerships don't need to occur at a national or federal level or at a state level. They can occur at a local level. They can occur in a small setting. They can occur in a neighborhood. They can occur in a suburban area. But it is important that we use the data that we have for those particular settings and that those partnerships work for that common purpose that for that partnership to work, there needs to be proper communication. And that communication needs to be backed by some political commitment that, as I said, could be local, state, or federal. Sectors that are involved, mentioned it several times, health sector, city planning, policy, finance, and development agencies, transportation sector indeed, academic centers, public, community, private sector industries, and justice and law enforcement are really important. So these are all sectors that can team up. And you can team up at different levels to understand or to respond. You can start at a small in a small area and just do an intervention for a small area and see if it works there. Many times interventions that get uh, scaled up at a city or national level have started by demonstrating that they work in a small area. But this is really important. And for that, you need to actually collect information collect data that comes from this sectors, sitting down with all these sectors and trying to understand what those data mean for each one of the sectors with the one purpose of working together for that particular plan, which is increase safety and reduce the trend of increases in traffic injuries. So you need to plan, develop those interventions, implement those interventions, translate those interventions and those plans into action and define the different roles and responsibilities that each sector has and monitor that so that when you monitor that, you can actually measure what happened in the beginning, what happened at the end. With that, I conclude my presentation and um, I will open it again for questions. Thank you very much. That was fantastic. And, and I think the power in particular in that last slide is, is the monitoring means you can then circle back and continuously improve as well. Absolutely, absolutely. That is certainly one issue. That's that's the whole idea uh, of that monitoring is you can revisit your problem, see how it changed, if it changed, and maybe scale it up or or do a better job or continue doing it if you're already doing a good job. Excellent. I'll, I'll, sorry for running over everyone. We just have a few questions I'll, I'll fire out to, um, to Andreas. So uh, Mick's got one here. What do you see as the most concerning recent trend? Good question. That's a very good question. Well, that it's it's also a general question. I could answer that mm -hmm. in so many ways. Um, you could I could answer in terms of trend of uh, uh, problems, emerging problems in the transportation sector. I will tell you probably in my view, and having worked in many places on this topic, I've worked in this topic in every continent pretty much. The most troubling trend is actually not integrating information, not sharing it, and not creating those common goals. When you create those common goals, when you create that collaboration, and when you create those actions, be it at a local level, at a state or a national level, you are much more effective when you show that those collaborations have an effect. It is really really powerful and really important. Not doing that, that's a very big problem. I would say that a trend or a perennial problem in many places is the fact that we are not actually engaging in those collaborations sufficiently enough. Australia collects amazing amounts of data, really good data. We can do a better job at integrating it. Right. Um, Mick's got a follow-up question. All businesses are collecting large amounts of data, such as like IVMS. What do you see as the key measures that determine if we have good drivers or not so good drivers? Well, the obviously the data that you collect is going to vary and you're, it's going to be limited sometimes by the type of, of, uh, of resources that you have to actually collect those data. A lot of the data are public. 
uh, fortunately, and you can actually integrate a lot of that public uh, information. Good drivers versus bad drivers. That's one element. Um, as we said, you know, you have good drivers, bad drivers. Well, why are they bad drivers? Are they bad drivers because they are insufficiently trained? Are they bad drivers because um, they are driving vehicles that are substandard and maybe they're at a higher risk? Are they bad drivers? What are the conditions that you define as bad drivers? That is really important. And that's just one element. Remember, one element is the behavior of people. Vehicles are also important and the place where vehicles are. The whole infrastructure is important too. So defining what is a good and a bad driver here is important. Is it a person that is actually engaging more or being linked to more incidents? Maybe that's a condition that you define as a bad driver. But maybe those drivers are driving in areas that are at a higher risk of engaging in incidents because of other conditions. Either the vehicles you're driving or the place that they're driving is more dangerous because there's more, more risks. So defining what is a good and a bad driver is really important. But a driver is one element of the whole picture. And even from an organizational point of view, work pressures, the scheduling, have they had long hours? Are they putting, do they feel pressure to do more? Are there more jobs? Have they had a meal? Um, like you said, so there's a lot of elements that can go in there that, that is around the driver that could be causing those conditions that you need to explore. Absolutely. Um, I've got two questions and then we'll have to close out because we're running way over. Um, Jaden asks, in Queensland, we currently have a 50 cent fare initiative to promote the use of public transport. What does research tell us about how increased patronage in public transport impacts road safety performance? That's a really good question. I can tell you, I live in the in city of Washington, D.C., and one thing that the city has been doing since 2012, probably 2010, they started actually putting, um, creating and developing a, a bigger infrastructure for, for bicycles. And at the same time, they uh, gave a series of incentives to people to, to use those bicycles and to link it to the public transportation system, to the to the metro that, that we have here. Uh, by integrating different modes of transportation, one of the things that they observed is that people who were more likely to do exercise actually stopped, started using less the train and more the bicycles, and therefore reduced the pressures that existed on the train system because of excess of people using it. Now, if you have a system where you're actually trying to introduce incentives so that they use more a transportation system like a public system, that is really important because what you are trying to achieve there is to reduce the congestion through the mode that you have through motor vehicles, reduce the congestion uh, and the density of motor vehicles in different places, and therefore uh, lighten up the burden on the overall road system infrastructure, making it easier perhaps to, for those who need to use the roadways, use them in a much more efficient way. So by creating those incentives, you're trying to deviate or to, to uh, make that a certain po proportion of the population use a type of service that will yield uh, some benefits for them. They will transport them at the expense of benefiting another mode of transportation. And so those incentives can be really efficient. I gave you a couple of examples of how those incentives can modulate and can lower the pressures on different modes of transportation in the settings. And our last question here from Maria, why in understanding behavior do we only talk about education and not about expert professionals such as traffic psychology as an important partner in data collection? Excellent point. And um, I omitted that, and, and that is my fault. But absolutely, I think that is really important. The, uh, it's not only educating and training people. That is uh, one element. But uh, understanding the whole psychology that goes behind. And one of the reasons why technology and observing drivers is really important to understand the psychology of drivers and how they're interacting as events happen. And when you use technology and measure that level of information, you can actually understand a series of conditions in a particular setting of, of driving. But you could also apply that to the specific socio socioeconomic or the specific conditions in which a person is. If I'm under stress for a variety of reasons, 
maybe my performance is not going to be the same. So the 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 application of and the use of transportation psychology is also extremely important. And I didn't mean by saying education, I didn't mean to minimize that. Perhaps what I want to say is that the behavioral aspects, rather than the, the education, the behavioral aspects and understanding the behavioral aspects is really important. So I agree with you that it's very important there. Fantastic. And now I get to the last question, Andres. Um, okay. If we can just close out with, uh, what's the one take-home message you'd like to leave everyone with? Look, uh, data are important, but data are only important when data are used for a common purpose. No matter what sector you are, it is important to share that information, to team up with others, to actually understand the problem of road transportation that you have and provide better solutions. Use data for action. That is the best you can do. What a lovely way to close out, mate. Thank you so much for your time above and beyond coming in on your public holiday. And uh, Maria, <laughs> congratulations, Professor uh, Andreas, on, on the brilliant presentation. I echo that. So thank you much for your time and thank you to our audience who, who joined us today. Thank you very much. A pleasure to be here.